Tonight I want to start a new series, like I said earlier, it's going to be on cults, false religions, and false churches. And so there's, there's quite a bit of that around here. We like to think that, you know, everybody that names the name of Christ is actually a Christian church or a denomination, but there are cults out there that will call themselves Christian. There are false uh, religions out there that will, you know, that all, you know, try to say that we encompass Christ, but they also bring along other false, you know, gods as well. And, uh, and then there's false churches that, you know, come out and say that they're, you know, that obviously that they're a, a church, but they're actually not. And so we're going to go through some of those uh, tonight as well. So like I said, if you have your Bibles, Galatians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 6 and uh, end at verse 9. The Bible reads, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you uh, into, the gra- uh, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, go- uh, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say, uh, so I, uh, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than uh, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit tonight as we, um, as we go, uh, go through this, uh, this cult, this false religion. Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with us, Lord. Uh, give us ears to hear. Lord, uh, that we would be not only uh, hearers but doers of the word. Lord, that your f- uh, word would fall upon fertile soil upon our hearts. And Lord, I pray again that you would uh, fill me with your spirit, Lord, that I would preach your word as a fire shut up into my bones, in, in Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to take a glance at Mormonism. Mormonism, we actually, and you say, well, you know, uh, we don't have to worry about that, there's none around here. Well, actually, there. I remember a couple of weeks ago, Doc said that, you know, a couple came to his door over in Hayti, so they're a lot closer than what you think, and then... I remember back at the chili cook-off, I saw him walking around, beginning, uh, you know, beginning to talk to people um, about you know, uh, the Mormon faith. And so they would actually you know, call themselves a, a, a Christian group. They would actually call, refer to themselves as Christians. And so what we see in this portion of Scripture from, uh, in Galatians, the Apostle Paul is obviously writing to the church in Galatia, and he's telling them, you know what, he says, you know what, even if we, like the apostles or an angel from heaven, preach another gospel that was, you know, other, another gospel than what was preached to you from us originally, let them be accursed. He says, you know what, and the fact that, that he, you know, that he says, you know what, I am, I, he says, I marvel that you are so, uh, they are, that ye are so soon removed. And the fact uh, of them uh, just giving up Christ that easily. They got saved, but then all of a sudden some false teachers and, uh, and you know, these cult leaders came in and began to uh, teach them another gospel so quickly. And it is possible. It is possible for a person to be saved and get caught up in a cult. Now, you know, some will say, well, does that person, you know, go to hell then if they get caught up in a cult? No, they got saved but that's why the Bible refers to the, you know, a lot of those that are saying that you're in error, that you have deviated from the truth. But the thing is that, yes, they are saved. Why? Because they got saved. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that you know, what the Bible says is that you know, when we, we are saved, we are saved, right? We can't lose it, you know, all those things. But the thing is that we can get ourselves into error, and we can, uh, we can deviate from the truth. The thing, that's the reason why we need to be reading the Word of God the Word of God, not all this other stuff. I remember a couple years ago I preached on the Bible that we should have. And then out of that one, you know, one came up and said, hey, is this the Bible? And it was a Jehovah's Witnesses Bible. And so the thing is, is that they will come out and put Holy Bible on it. They will do all these things. But if you don't know, you can get yourself caught up in error. And that's something that we need to realize, that we need to know, is that, you know what, there is the Word of God, and then there's a whole bunch of counterfeits. And uh, we talked about it this morning at the uh, nursing home. It was a great time. We had, uh, I think it was about, I think, 13 or 14 that I counted this morning uh, you know, up there. And we discussed, the, you know, we talked about the fact, what, is, what does the word Bible mean? What's the meaning of the word Bible? Does anybody know? Miss Mary ought to know because she was there. So no cheating, Miss Mary. It just means, nope, it just means book. 
So when the city says, that's why when you hear so many times when people come out and they say, the good book, or they say, you know, I'm about the book, they're talking about the Bible, all right? And so that is the holy, you know, the holy book. It is the book. It is the book above every other book. There's no other book that even compares, to, you know, to the Word of God, right? But you'll have some out there that will try to re, you know, give another testament, give all these other things saying, you know, God added on to his Word. And we're going to see that tonight with Mormonism. Now, Mormonism is one of the fastest fastest growing and most successful cults in the history of the United States and, it's, uh, and perhaps the world, like I said, is the Mormons, which are officially known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Not to be confused with the one down the street over here that says the Church of Jesus Christ. All right? There's a Church of Jesus Christ. I don't know what they believe, you know, on that one. I may have to check that one out, you know, to see where they're at on that one, but we're going to talk about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or as oftentimes the, uh, the little acronym is LDS. They'll, they'll call, you know, refer to themselves as LDS, but, and they'll also refer to themselves as Christians. But uh, they are, oh, sorry, they have been increasing at an average rate of 300,000 converts a year, as many as 75% of whom may have been former uh, Protestants or former Christians, ones that actually believed the truth, but yet were caught off air. Why? Because you know they're not, they're they're falling for this. They're falling for the Mormon faith. They're falling for this you know this false faith, this false doctrine. And so we need to realize that seventy five percent, seventy five percent of them were it, you know, Bible believers, and then they went off in error. They strayed. So don't think that, you know, you know, that's, you know, above and beyond, oh, I can never be, you know, uh, duped. Well, the only way you can't be duped is if you're hearing his word and you know his word. And you know when somebody's lying to you or trying to twist scripture to you. So there are two major issues, and I mean, obviously there's other issues, but there are two major issues that the Mormons and Christianity uh, disagree upon. What is, what they refer to as authoritative re- revelation or scripture and who or what God is. All right, who who is God or what is God? That's that's their issue. So we'll we'll start back at, here at the at the beginning of this, at the beginning of, of Mormonism. The beginning of it is Joseph Smith Jr. All right, Joseph Smith Jr. He was 14 years old. All right, at the time he was 14 years old, he had his first vision or his first visit. That uh, that. At that time, and you'll find out you know, later on who this angel was, but he had his first visit, his first vision, that he believed that there are two persons whom he believed to be uh, the father and the son appearing before him. Now, what do we just read about in Galatians? What, do we, what did it just say? But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, right? So... Red flags ought to go up right away when he's talking about, you know, that he believes that these, you know, that the Father and the Son appear to him. He asked them which Christian denomination he should join, and they told him to, uh, to join none of them because why? They were all wrong and corrupt. This is one of the things you'll see, especially, you know, they'll say the Bible is corrupt. The Bible has been corrupted by man, and we need to fix it. That's one of their big things is that they need to, uh, to fix it. The second time he was visited, or the second vision, the angel, Marani, appeared at his bedside and told him of a book written on golden plates. Now, mind you, they cannot find these golden plates. All right? They cannot, uh, as, soon as, as soon as he wrote them down and he translated them, they were gone. They can't find them. You know, how, uh, how amazing that is when... Uh, you have something that you're supposed to have and say, this is the foundation of our faith, but oh, well, we don't have them anymore. So how are you going to cross-check it? You can't, right? So they're written on these golden plates by former inhabitants, which, uh, was the, uh, which, they believe, uh, you know, which he says is the fullness of the everlasting gospel. That obviously up until this point, everybody else has been wrong, but he's going to set everything right. So four years later, Smith found the plates. He finds these plates that he was told about, and he started to translate them. And as he translates the, the plates, he would sit behind a curtain with the plates and dictate each line to a scribe outside the curtain. Do we see any kind of problems there, right? 
What happens if, you know, he don't hear him right? He also, uh, he also did this by, he, he interpreted the plates by using what they call a seer stone to translate this, uh, to translate the plates. Anybody who knows what a, a seer stone, there's a lot, a lot of new age. This is a new age philosophy, a seer stone. Basically, and, and he, he, like he says, to be able to translate things. But basically, he's having demons help him uh, to translate these things. And this is the translation that became later on. It's called the Book of Mormon. So he gets out, you know, at the age of 14, he begins to have these visions. And so probably around the age of 18 or 19, he finally, after these two visions... He finds the plates, he, trans- he translates them, that's the Book of Mormon. That's where he gets them uh, from. Later revelations or re- uh, later visits that he gets, because he keeps getting visits, it's not just the fact that he gets two and that's it. He gets later visits between, uh, between this time period is 1830 to 1840. Smith continued to receive revelation that guided him into where to go and what to do next, as well as how to... Uh, establish new and different doctrines. Why would he have to establish, uh, establish new and different doctrines if they're based off the Bible, right? One of them was the Book of Commandments in 1833, and then there was the Doctrine of Covenants in 1835. It was, sorry, Doctrines and Covenants of 1835. So he began, both are considered to be inspired scripture alongside the Book of Mormons. Did you ever notice that there's like three extra books, but yet they have yet to refer to the word, uh, you know, the, the actual Bible? But they began to have problems. The Mormons began to have problems after this. Gee, I wonder why. He didn't tell them until after he, uh, he translated everything. Cole, because he had to go out there, he had to go and get, you know, uh, the, yeah, pretty much he can sell uh, ice to an Eskimo, all right? So in 1843, the Mormons were not very well liked by non-Mormons due to their uh, their practices and beliefs. The Nubu uh, Expositor in uh, Illinois published stories exposing the Mormons a uh, practice of polygamy. Polygamy is the fact of a husband with many wives. Because they would say, oh, well, you know, the Old Testament talks about it. Let me, you know, let me just put this out there. Yes, the Old Testament talks about polygamy, about, you know, the husband having many wives, but it's never what God intended. You never see God blessing them, you know, you know, never blessing the marriage and saying, you know what, you have 700 wives or 300 concubines. That is wonderful. I'm talking about King Solomon. Now, he did bless Solomon, but he never blessed his marriages. All right? And so, but they'll go on to say, well, this is the way that God designed it. They forget about the whole Adam and Eve thing that God designed, you know, man and woman, not man and women. All right? They forget that whole thing. So, like I said, this newspaper began to publish those stories talking about their uh, practice of polygamy. Smith ordered his fathers to destroy the newspaper. And he wound up in jail in Carthage, Illinois. When I say destroy, he was actually literally trying to destroy the building. He was trying to destroy everything about it so they didn't have any evidence. Of what they did. While in jail, 200 Mormon followers, so he's getting a, a following at this time. 200 Mormon followers attached the, uh, the, uh, attached the, the jail building and, uh, sorry, attacked the jail building. And this is where Joseph Smith died in the ensuing gunfight. So Mormons claim that he died a Christian martyr, but he actually died fighting using a six-shooter he smuggled in with him and killed two people. But he was a Christian martyr. He was going out there shooting people. This is something that when they come to your doorstep or when they talk to you, they won't acknowledge that. Why would they? Because they're, you know, they're like, oh, he was a martyr. No, he was a killer. All right, that's what he was. He was a murderer. And then after he died, Brigham Young came about. You may know, uh, you know a college and a university out in Utah called Brigham Young University, or BYU. That is a Mormon university. After the uh, death of Joseph Smith, he took power over the Mormons. He moved the group from Illinois, because obviously they don't like him there, to the Great Salt Lake in 1847. 
All this time is because there are different angels visiting them. He actually, on their way, will stop in Jefferson City, Missouri. You know why? Because that's where the Garden of Eden is, according to the Mormons. The Garden of Eden is in Jefferson uh, City, Missouri. That's where they believe. But there's people that didn't like them there, and so eventually they get pushed out all the way out to Utah and the Great Salt Lake, all, uh, all the way out that way. By the way, I don't want to like ruin it for you, but I am going to ruin it for you. If you like Dr. Pepper, guess who owns Dr. Pepper? The Mormons. Which is funny because they say that, uh, you know, that you're not allowed to have any, this is a side note, by the way, that you're not allowed to have any mind-altering drugs or anything like that as a Mormon, and that includes caffeine. But they make provision, yeah, they don't drink coffee, but they make provision for Dr. Pepper. Why? Because they own the business. Oh, no, they drink it. Yes. But it's okay because it's, you know, yeah. There's a lot of weird stuff in there. I'm not going to get really deep into a lot of their weird beliefs, but there's a lot of weird stuff that they go about, all right? After this, they continue to have government troubles. The government was giving them problems. You know what? And this is probably one of the good you know, the times that the government actually was good about doing this, all right? The Mormons continue to have trouble with the U.S. government over their doctrines. Mostly it was polygamy. Finally, you know, the, the U.S. government you know, basically said, okay, you know, you're off into Utah, Kind of like the military used to have, don't ask, don't tell. If you have multiple wives, you, you can't get married to them by the state. But if we, don't, you know, if we don't know about it, it's up to you. That's where they finally come. The government finally you know, kind of gave in to them. But Brigham Young, it, his, he's an iron-fisted ruler. He advocates, uh, he advocates, uh, advocates the death penalty for any white person mixing with an African-American. This is also the reason where they come along and they say, you know what, that as, as you repent and you are continually repenting of your sin, this is where repenting of your sin to get saved comes from. So if you ever, you know, if you ever hear a preacher, a Christian preacher, get up and say, you must repent of all of your sins in order to be saved, that's where it comes from. It's come from the Mormon church. They're the ones who started it. And you say, well, you know, I don't believe that. Well, that's good. But the, 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 a lot of the modern Bibles are now beginning to insert that in the Bible. It was never in there before, but now all of a sudden they're inserting it, and you'll see it. One of them I know is the New Living Translation, uh, because I've read it myself. I went online you know, just to make sure, but that was one of them. And so, but what they do, like I said, as you repent of your sins, as you, you know, over and over, you, whatever, you're, the, the whiter your skin will get. That includes for African-American people, Hispanic people, whatever, that the more you repent, the whiter your skin gets. And I would just say, I think that that's pretty racist, don't you? That somehow or another that white people are more, you know, holy than people that have darker skin. So what happens in the summer when you get a tan or you get a burn? Oh, you be- it's probably because you haven't repented of your sin. That's why, you know, that's... That's the reason why your skin, you know, uh, you know, darkened. You know, it wasn't because you know the sun; it was because you have sin in your life. All right. So, and I made this, I made this comment before, and I'll make this again. It makes me wonder about Michael Jackson, because Michael Jackson was a brown man, and somehow or another he became a white woman. I don't know, understand? Well, he's on the lines. He also taught that Jesus had been conceived through literal sexual relations between God the Father and the Virgin Mary. That there was sexual relations that happened between God the Father and the Virgin Mary that conceived Jesus Christ. And you'll see the reason why they made this statement here in a moment. In the 20th century, with the 20th century uh, starting, the Mormons strived to have a, a better positive public image in order to gain more, uh, you know, more converts. Why? Because if they can get you in the door and begin to lie to you, then you're more likely you're going to stay around, right? And then as you get into it further and further, then you begin to, you know, as you're further uh, brainwashed, you begin to believe it. Because I'll tell you this, most of the converts, most of the ones, you, uh, the Mormons you'll see, they will be white people. Why? I mean, why not? I mean, what, I mean, I'm sorry. What, what black person out there or Hispanic person or whatever is going to go into a religion that says that 
If your skin doesn't get whiter, that means you're still going to hell. It doesn't make sense, right? And, you know, the, and the, the, the white people like it. Why? Well, especially the white men. They can marry as many, uh, they can have as many uh, women around as they want to. I mean, there's the, uh, well, uh, there's a show, I, you know, um, a couple of years, Sister Wives. That's all about polygamy. It's all about Mormons. It's all about, you know, how this guy has whatever, and that they're all like, kind of like sisters, and they're all like whatever, and you get to be with them tonight, I'll be with them tomorrow kind of a thing. Because they're all married. He ain't go, he's not going to go around being promiscuous. He's only going to stay with his, you know, you know, 10, 15 women at home. Anybody see anything messed up so far? I mean, I hope so. <laughs> but like I said, they, they had to have a, a, a better positive public image. They needed a better PR. You know, they needed a better PR to say, you know what? All these people are hating us and everything else, so we need to have a better image, all right? They, they began to claim themselves not as Mormons, but as Christians. Christianity, they would say that they claim that Mormonism is Christianity, Christianity is Mormonism, that they are one and the same. So oftentimes if you meet someone, if you meet them and they're usually, they're wearing, this is typical, it's usually uh, two guys together, black pants, white shirt, they usually have a black name tag, and it says elder so-and-so, and it'll say Latter-day Saints at the bottom of it, or Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The funny thing is that the elders are usually about 18, 19 years old. They're very elderly, right? So that's how you can tell when they come to your door. But many millions of converts, uh, converts in the Mormon church today base their definition of Christian on four standard works of Scripture. They say number one is the Bible, which they don't trust. Because remember, the Bible has been corrupted. The Book of Mormon is number two. The third one, doctrine and covenants. And then fourthly, the pearl of great price. The pearl of great price. The, don't worry, it's just a bunch of lies. You don't have to worry about what's in that one. The Mormons claim that the biblical canon never closed. Like, whereas this Bible, we say the canon of Scripture is closed, it cannot be added to, it cannot be taken away. This is the Word of God, right? That you're not adding to this, you're not taking away. Why? Because, well, for one thing, the Bible says that if you add or you take away from it, there's going to be a curse upon you, right? But that's the Word of God. It's been closed. But they'll say, you know what? It never closed. It's still open. And the revelation continued with Joseph Smith, as well as the other presidents and prophets of the church right up until today. So you have presidents and prophets in that church, in this false church, in this cult, still adding to these things right now. Why? Because the canon of Scripture is still open. It never closed. This goes you know, really closely you know, if you look at the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, they'll say that they believe the Bible, but they don't because they never read it because they believe whatever the Pope says. And whatever revelation that the Pope has, they go ahead and they believe that. Even though that there are some Catholics that will say, I don't agree with the Pope. When they make the, that statement of, I don't believe the Pope, they are literally, only, to them, they are literally saying, I don't believe Jesus Christ. Because to them, the Pope is Jesus Christ on earth. The same as like the Mormons have that same, kind of, that same kind of mindset. They would never say that, but that's their mindset, is that whatever they say, that's the gospel truth. And it's the, you know, that's a flat-out lie. The Mormons will not perform, uh, perform textual studies that consistently confirm the validity of Scripture. They won't, look, they won't take the Bible, have that analysis, and say, okay, this is the Word of God, and then have theirs and find out that theirs is a lie. They won't do it. Why? Because if they do that, their whole entire religion falls apart right, right before their eyes, right? They only rely on the Book of Mormon, yet they have no manuscripts for it whatsoever. There's no manuscripts. There's no, like, earlier texts, or there's no, like, other, like, you know, in, uh, we talked about the Texas Receptus, right, as being the line of manuscripts that you want to go with, which is the received text. That's what we believe as far as that the received text, the Texas Receptus, Receptus is the line of scriptures that we believe is right. Why? Because, it, you know, it shows it coming from Antioch. It shows it coming from, you know, the, the first place that they were called Christians, which is in Antioch. And so 
That's why we believe that. Then they have nothing to, you know, to back it up. There's over 5,000 manuscripts, uh, over 5,000 manuscripts to, uh, actually 5,500 to um, verify th- my Bible. Theirs, they have none. Okay? According to Joseph Smith, the golden plates were taken back by the angel Moroni. So the Mormons simply rely on his word as a prophet. I'm sorry, when I look at his name of Moroni, I keep on thinking moron. But there is an I at the end because it's whatever. And to me, honestly, when you begin to look at it, but you have many people who are duped into this religion. And, you know, I don't want to call them moron, uh, you know, morons, but I think you know, a moron, you know, duped them, you know, this demon, this false angel. Number two is there, I'm going to talk a little bit just for a moment here about their theology. I talked about it a little bit. I want to go into it a little bit more. Although Joseph Smith claimed that the Book of Mormon was the most complete book on earth and that it contains the fullness of the gospel, he added 13 key doctrines, uh, Mormon doctrines, into the doctrine and covenants that are not found anywhere in the Book of Mormon. So whereas he said the Book of Mormon is the most complete, this is it, this is that, you know, closed after I'm done, he added more later on. You'll always find this. I mean, we found that with the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, uh, that they'll make a statement, but then they'll change it and say, well, no, we didn't really mean that. This is what we meant, you know, kind of a thing. So some of these, these 13 doctrines, these new ones that they came up with, was the plur- plurality of gods, or poly- polytheism, which, in other words, they, uh, you know, that there are multiple gods. They're not just one god. There's multiple gods. And what this became later on is that if... The husband was a good husband, or sorry, was a good man. It doesn't matter if you're a good husband. If you're a good man, you kind of go hand in hand, but to them it doesn't matter. If they're a good Mormon, they get their own planet when they die. And if you're a good wife, it doesn't matter what number you are, but if you're a good wife, he may invite you to his planet. All the ladies in here are like, where do I sign up? And then another one is that God is an exalted man. That God is an exalted man. That he's not necessarily God, but he's an exalted man. That he became God-like because you, you, you find later on that if you're a good Mormon, that you become a God. A human being's ability, there, there's a, a human being's ability to become God. That's obviously, like I talked about earlier, that they get their own planet. There's three degrees of heaven. You know, obviously good, better, best, I guess. Obviously, polygamy became, you know, uh, came into this part as well. And then finally, you know, on this one, the eternal progression and baptism for the dead. This is also, I believe, pretty close to Mormon. I can't remember who, who did it first. Or who claimed it first? That either this is a Catholic doctrine or a Mormon doctrine. But this is the, the one where that basically you can be baptized for a dead person, kind of like purgatory. So all of a sudden, like if you know Aunt Sherry dies, you know I can go over and say, you know, I want to be baptized for her so that way she can get into heaven. The doctrine, uh, uh, the doctrine and covenants also uh, contained a number of prophecies by Smith that did not come true, which makes him what? A false prophet. What does the Bible say about false prophets? If you want to, you can turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we'll find out what the Bible says about uh, false prophets. Deuteronomy 18, verse, uh, verses 20 through 22. The Bible reads, says, But the prophet, Deuteronomy 18, first five books. I'm just trying to help you. All right. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet what shall what die. And if, uh, if thou say in thine heart, how shall we 
know uh, the word which the Lord hath not spoken. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So what does he say? If somebody, if a prophet comes out and says he's prophesying on behalf of the Lord, the Lord says, you know what, if I have not told them, it's not going to come true. And if it does not come true, then they are a liar. And then you what? They're supposed to be put to death. This is the, uh, you know, one of the big things that I also see in the Assemblies of God is that fact. There are ones that have got up and they have prophesied and it has not come true. I've been in churches that have done this. And I said, should we not do what the Bible says? I said, or at least, you know, we should make that comment. It would keep people's mouths shut to make sure that they're actually hearing from the Lord. I've heard, I heard a woman one time get up, I kid you not, got up and said, the Holy Spirit is like a machine gun mowing down people for the Lord. Does that sound like something for the Lord? But then she pre presumed, or sorry, then she went on, she said it, she stopped and she said, oh, wait. That's not it. And then began to correct herself. I've never heard God correct himself right in the middle of a prophecy. But nobody said a word to her, including the pastor. I need to throw her out. I need to throw her out. Or do biblically. If we're only in a, a biblical nation, there would be a lot less false prophets. I'll tell you this. This is a side note. I'm going to take a little rabbit trail right here right, right now. During COVID and afterwards, remember all the, all the hype about, you know, the fact that President Trump was going to get back in office, he's really in there and all this other stuff. The best thing that happened, you know, with COVID and the best thing that happened with this, very, very low on the total, but the best thing that happened by President Biden getting in is that all the false prophets were exposed. That's the best thing that happened when President Biden got in there. And that was also, you know, uh, it showed off an awful lot of false prophets because, you know what, all those ones that were saying, well, President Trump's still the president, he's still in there, he's still in office, he's working behind the scenes, he's whatever, all sorts of stuff. Do not listen to them. Why? They were prophet lying, not prophesying. Don't be helping them out. That's my rabbit trail. Sometimes, you know, the rabbit, you know, on my rabbit trails get awful tired because I tell an awful lot of rabbit trails. A key understanding of the Mormons is that they have absolutely, un uh, the key, yeah, that they have absolutely unshakable faith in Joseph Smith. They believe him no matter what. They say this is the man, this is who is. Facts do not matter. You know that saying, that, you know, say facts don't care about your feelings. You could tell them until you're blue in the face all the facts you want to. They don't care. So whatever happened, Smith is still their source of divine revelation, the foundation of their entire viewpoint. It does not matter if he was caught lying. It does not matter even with the fact that there's evidence showing that he killed two people while he was in jail, that he was not a Christian martyr, that he was trying to start an insurrection, basically, to get his people out. It does not matter to them. You say, well, then how would you ever reach them for the Lord? This is where you need to be praying when you go out witness, you know, witnessing, going door to door. It's because the only one that's going to be able to speak to them, to get their heart to change, and this is what you should do all the time. Miss Mary has to remind me sometimes to pray for this, is that the Holy Spirit would speak to them. Because it's going to take an awful lot. You know, they've been lied to, and they've been told to. It's a lot of like a, a lot of these other cults. They've been lied to so much that it does not matter how much truth that you tell them. Unless the Holy Spirit quickens their heart, they're not going to come out of it. That doesn't mean that you go up to them like, oh, they're Mormon. No, pfft, just leave them alone and walk away from them. No, you try and talk to them. Let the, you know, the, the, the Bible says that the word of God will not return void. And that's what we need to come to them with. Let's look at eternal, prog uh, eternal progression. I talked about it a little bit earlier. This to them is a doctrine of God. You know, us as Christians say that God is eternal, the only God in the universe, the supreme creator of everything out of nothing, right? That's what we would say. That God, you know, spoke everything into existence, and that's what happened. He's the only God in the universe. 
that he has always been and he always will be, and you know, it, that no matter what. The Mormon doctrine is that he is progressive. He, having a, that he has a, attained his exalted state by advancing along a path that his children, Mormons, are permitted to follow. So in other words, their God, which they say is Jesus Christ, actually, you know, and Jesus Christ is a lesser God, by the, you know, that they will say that, you know what, the God that, you know, right now is that he has worked his way on up to where he is now. He's just an exalted human. That's all he is. They believe that God the Father is, like I said, is really an exalted man. That he is one of a species that Mormons call gods. Their gods existed before the Heavenly Father who rules the earth today. In Mormon thinking, God is not the eternal creator, the first cause of everything. He was created or begotten himself or born of himself by another God who had been created and begotten by, and was begotten by someone else. So there's a whole lot of begotten going on. That basically, these gods keep on you know, uh, giving birth to other gods and other gods, and they keep on working themselves up the totem pole, and there's this other god, and there's other, you know, they just keep on working themselves up and whatever. And the god that we have uh, that, that right now, that he's, he's progressing. He's kind of, you know, it, if you want to look at it this way, he's kind of making it up as he goes along. Mormons believe that Jesus came to the earth from the spirit world to become savior of mankind. His birth, like I said earlier, that he was not born of Mary, uh, sorry, that he was born of Mary, but not conceived by the Holy Spirit as the Bible teaches. I'm going to tell you, they believe that God the Father came down to earth in human form to have sexual intercourse with Mary. Because they don't believe that, you know, the, the, the three in one, they believe that it's, like I said, a whole bunch of gods. So that came down. So uh, for Jesus' death, on the cross, Jesus, that when he died on the cross, that he gained fullness, that he returned to heaven, fully exalted, and reigns with the Father in power and glory. According to Smith, Jesus was eventually, uh, will eventually take the Father's place as Father God uh, moves on to the higher realms of glory. Moving on up. I don't know if it's to the east side, but, you know. Anybody seen any problems so far? Anybody confused by some of the stuff that's, you know, because it's, it's very confusing, you know, with where they come up. But that's the thing is, that I think a lot of times when they come up and they begin to twist so much stuff together that they keep a person in, in like, confusion all the time so that way they're always wondering, but they're going, I can't question that. I just got to go with it. I just got to believe it. It. I'll tell you, you know, this other little one, I mean, it goes as far as they have a particular kind of underwear. And this underwear is holy, not with holes in it, but it's holy. That, it, that if you don't have that, you ain't holy. By the way, I've been, um, when we were youth pastors out in Colorado, we had, you know, we had a meeting in Park City, Utah. And our senior pastor, he's like, hey, while we're over here in Utah, let's go down to Salt Lake City. Let's go see the Mormon Tabernacle. It's a beautiful building. I'll tell you that right now. It's a beautiful building for heresy and damnation. That's, that's what it is. But it's a beautiful building. I mean, it's whatever. But it's, it's, it's a temple of Satan. I mean, it's just you call it what it is. Here is, I'm going to tell you here, this is number four, is the major Mormon errors. The major, you said there's a lot of errors. Here's some big ones. Because there are people out there that will say that Mormons are Christians, that there are believers, that we should fellowship with them. And this is the problem that I have a lot of, you know, a lot of with what they call ecumenicalism, is the fact that if a person uh, you know, that if a person names the name of Christ, we should have fellowship with them. There's a lot of Christians that believe this. They call it unity, that we need to have unity among Christians. The Bible never says that. 
The Bible says that if, you know, basically if somebody is in gross error, that you are not to even, you know, that you are to separate yourself from them. They're not the same. Okay? And one of the ways you could tell is, you know, one thing is, is that you should not, if, if somebody does not believe that you are saved, this, you, know, you know, like the Bible says, which is by, you know, grace through faith alone, right? The Bible says by grace you know, are you saved, right? Through faith. If you don't, you know, if, if they believe that you've got to repent of all your sins, the Bible says that you're not even, you know, that, that's, that, they're not, that that person's not saved. If a person says that they have to repent of all their sins, or they have to be water baptized, or if they whatever, that you, you know, that, you know what, that they're not even believers. Why? Because the Bible says that salvation is by faith alone. That if you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what the Bible teaches, not the Mormons, but the Bible teaches, you know what, that's how you're saved, that you believe on the Lord, you, have, you put your faith and your trust in him to save you alone. Not the fact of you repenting of all your sins, being water baptized, speaking in tongues, doing all this other stuff. That's all, you know, that's extra, you know, all this other stuff. The Bible would say that they're not saved. Why? Because if you're trusting in your own works, and you say, well, what's the work? Repentance would be your work. You're saying, I'm trusting in myself to uh, you know, get rid of all my sins. If you could get rid of all your sins, you would be perfect. Let's just put it that way. And you would not need Jesus Christ. But that's what it's taught. Most people don't look at what the logical conclusion of that doctrine and that teaching is, that if you are able to repent of all your sins, you are perfect. You don't need Jesus. That, and I refer to that in the realm of salvation. Salvation you know, is by faith, right? Grace through faith, right? That if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. That's what the Bible says. I am not saying that you should never repent of your sin. What I'm saying is there are two separate things. Should you try and turn away from your sin? Yes. But it has nothing to do with your salvation. But people that will come up and say that you must repent of your sins in order to be saved, that is gross error. That is heresy. That is damnable heresy. You're sending people to hell. The other one is this. One of their errors is the Trinity. The Mormons, the Trinity uh, is the Trinity is not one God whose essence is found in three persons, but it is three gods with three distinct bodies. This is a damnable heresy. This would send you to hell as well because if you don't believe the Trinity, you know the God had three in one, as we believe. Then you, uh, the Bible says that that's a damnable heresy because why? Because that's another Jesus. That's another God that you're believing in. Actually, you're believing in three gods. They also, one of the errors is scripture. Scri- uh, Mormons take scripture passages that Christians use to teach the Trinity and turn them around to teach their own doctrine. Just like any other cult, they will twist scripture. One verse that they don't like, and this is a lot of cults, especially ones that, you know, just to say, well, you know what? Uh, you believe in three gods. No, we don't. Okay? One scripture that they don't like, that they want to take out and everything, is 1 John 5, 7. And I'll read that to you. Uh, well, let me I'll find that for you right now, since I brought it up. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And what? These three are one. They don't like that verse. Why? Because it explains, it explains the Trinity in one verse. That these three are one. They don't like that one. That's the one that they would stay away from. They would also, one of their errors is salvation. According to uh, Mormons, salvation comes in two parts, general and individual. General salvation is what Mormons mean uh, when they say, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind might be saved. The problem is, is this, general salvation is given regardless of a person's actions or belief. But because Jesus, or sorry, because Christ's atonement paid for Adam's sin only. They'll say that, you know, uh, Christ, you know, the, you know, it sounds great because they'll say all mankind might be saved. But they'll say the only one that his atonement paid for was Adam's sin. People are still responsible for their, uh, for their own personal sin, right? Christ's atonement provides the opportunity 
to earn individual salvation by obeying the laws and ordinances of the gospel. This is the other thing, is that you must believe the laws and ordinances and commandments. If you break them, then you need you know, to repent and you lost your salvation. That's what the Mormons teach. You have a lot of this one you know, also in the Hebrew Roots Movement that says that you must keep all of the commandments of the Old Testament. It's impossible. Because if you, you fail in one, you're guilty of them all. The Mormons list of requirements that must be met if a person is to merit forgiveness for personal sins and thereby attain godhood. This is how you're a good Mormon. Well, good Mormon man, because remember, ladies, you've got to be invited to their planet. Faith in Christ. Baptism. You need to be a member of the Latter-day Saint Church. Keeping the commandments. These are the Mormon commandments. Temple work. You've got to be working at your, you know, at your church. You've got to keep on doing all that. That's why a lot of times you go by the Mormon churches. Their, their yard is a 